Hey, School for Writer podcast listeners, if my voice doesn't sound familiar, I'm not Lauren, full disclosure. My name is Stephanie. I'm the community manager for School for Writers. You may have seen me posting on the School for Writers Instagram. I'm also currently part of Lauren's program, Write Your Friggin' Book Already, and looking forward to being a coach in the program for 2021. So today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Lauren Marie Fleming, author, film school graduate, law school graduate, career writer. There's nothing she can't do. I get to interview her for her birthday. It's her birthday today. Tell her happy birthday. And we talk about a little bit of everything. So Lauren and I both hope you enjoy this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, visit us on the Instagram, and enjoy. Hi, Lauren. I'm so happy to see you. And first and foremost, happiest of pandemic birthdays to you. Thank you. I feel like I'm really excited that you wanted to do this for my birthday because this feels, I don't get to do anything for my birthday and I'm a Sagittarius. So I go all out for my birthday. Like it's a month long celebration. I often travel to a foreign country. I often make my friends throw me large, massive parties. And this year I get to have a podcast party with you and all the people listening to celebrate. So I'm really excited about that. Podcast pandemic birthday party. We're dancing for those who are not watching this on the YouTubes, who are listening on the podcasts. Little shoulder moves. Little you shoulder, know. shoulder dances. Getting in the zone. Getting in the zone. Um, I really, before we get super started, I'm going to need you to tell me a little more about this shirt. And for those listening, <laughs> it's a lovely pink shirt with a heart in the middle and the word me inside the heart. Yeah, I was like... A little insecure about being interviewed on my own podcast for my birthday. And then I was like, mm -mm, just embrace that. Like, embrace that it's all about you right now today. So I put on some fancy earrings. I have some like jewelry diamond, not real diamonds, clips in my ear. I have, well, screw it. We're going to, we're going to call them real diamonds. They're real diamonds, you guys. I'm calling them real. I'm making them real. And then a shirt that has a heart and says me on it. And it's actually from this amazing store in Tijuana called Fakap. F-A-K-A-P. So if y'all are listening, you want to follow them on Instagram, they ship to the United States and they are in Mexico City and Tijuana. And I love them and they're ran by these amazing women. So go buy yourself a shirt and remind yourself to love yourself. I love that. And I love it because since you aren't able to celebrate the way that you want for a whole month, you just got to cram it all in. Cram it all in. I'm still going to celebrate for a month. I'm going to be the most obnoxious person in my household for the next month. However, I don't get to be obnoxious to 20,000 people, just my home, because I'm not leaving because pandemic. I hope that they're ready. I'm ready. I'm glad you're ready. Afar. <laughs> and I hope everybody listening is also ready. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm ready to jump in. I'm really excited for those listening. So um, I want to tell them who you are and why you're here interviewing me. Oh, yes. So, so Stephanie yeah. is my community manager, and you probably have seen her on the School for Writers Instagram and maybe sending you emails and scheduling in Writer Squad, writing sprints in our Write Your Friggin' Book Already. You're, you're in my Write Your Friggin' Book Already program. You are kind of my right-hand person helping build this empire of stories. And so... Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to you so people knew who you were because you are an integral part of making this podcast and this company and this empire that we're building happen. So thanks for doing this. And I have no idea. I just said anything you want to ask me, you can. So I'm excited to see what you want to ask me. <laughs> I've got some notes. Okay. Okay. So I've got notes. And the first question also allows me to kind of integrate how you and I even know each other. Perfect. Because it's a Steph Jagger question. And I'll tell you the question okay. so you can think about it. The question is, who you be? Who I be? So think Ooh. about it. And Steph Jagger, if you haven't heard of her, she's an author and all around amazing woman. And I came across Steph through a friend of mine and I did a group coaching program with her. And now you, Lauren, are doing a different program with Steph Jagger. And that's how I found you. I went to one of her retreats 
And I went because something big was going to happen from that retreat. And I didn't know what it was. And then a few months after the retreat, I got a little Lindsay, who we know slid into my DMS and said, Hey, have you started writing your book yet? Because this woman I know, Lauren is doing this, write your friggin' book already program. And that's how we met. And I just think it's the coolest story. (laughs) I love that. I love that because Steph Jacker is all about helping you tap into your intuition and tap into what signals, whatever you believe in out there signals are coming to tell you what to do next. And so I love that that led you to me and as a program participant. And then now as a member of my team. Yes. It pays to be a Jagger junkie. That's Jagger junkie. Myself. Yeah. <laughs> and if you haven't read it yet, Steph has an, a really beautiful memoir called Unbound, a story of snow and self-discovery about being a record holder for downhills, miles or feet or whatever, skied. I don't ski. Yeah. I don't do the sports thing. Um, downhill uh, in a year. And, but it's also this beautiful memoir of like, I don't, I don't do the, I don't do the sports, but it was still something that really moved me. And we met while she was writing it. And so I was, it was an honor to like be a, see a part of her writing it, be a part of a writing group, supporting her write it. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a beautiful experience seeing it come out and then reading it and holding it in my hands. And then now getting to be a part of coaching sessions with her is really beautiful. Yeah. My copy is right behind me. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So who you be? (sighs) Who I be? Hmm. I am Lauren Marie Fleming. I am the granddaughter of Jack and Eunice Fleming. And my mom's side of the family is a lot more complicated because there's like 20,000 people there, (laughs) but grandma Boots, grandma Sandy, grandpa Roy, Nana Blaba. There were so many like grandfathers throughout the time on my side. There's so many ancestors. There's so many people. My parents are Robert and Roseanne. My sister's Michelle. My brother is Andrew. And these people, when if you're really asking that question, who you be, they are so much a part of my DNA and my molecular self and who I am as a person. I'm a farmer's daughter. My dad is the third generation to farm that same land. I'm the fourth generation landowner of parts of that land. And that has formed who I am. Being fat and queer and a woman and a little bit radical and a lot of bit witchy and pretty progressive politically informs who I am and how I interact with this world. But all of that shows up through this form of storytelling. And it's shown up in theater. I helped start a community theater when I was young. It's shown up in the way in which I got in trouble for lying because I would say the truth was boring. So I'm gonna make a better story over here as a kid. It shows up in a way that I have constantly been that person who seeks the next adventure because it'll make a really good story. Um, And it shows up in the way that I have ran a business as a writer for the past 20 years now. I like, as soon as I I have had a, I've run a business as a writer for a little less than that, but I have been a professional writer making money off of my writing and pursuing writing as a career for a decade now. I will, this will be my 38th birthday that this is recorded on. We're recording it a couple days early, but it will come out on my 38th birthday. And I won my first writing competition when I was 16. And when I look at that, I'm like, whoa, okay, maybe I actually am a writer. Like now I feel like I can finally call myself a writer because it's been 20 years, but I was a writer the day I was born, if I'm being honest with myself. And people listening, you probably were writers the day you were born too. You just maybe took a little longer to find your way to it. Yeah. Ooh, I love all of that. So good. And now I'm curious, how has the pandemic been for you? How has it been overall? How has it impacted your writing, your business? So before the pandemic, I was working with a celebrity speaker, uh, help managing these massive events all over the world, helping with his content and coaching the speakers that were on the stage with him and um, hanging out with 
Like, I'm like, I danced with a billionaire. I hung out with the gold medal Olympian. I like ate a prime minister's leftover fruit plate. Like I was jet setting in one month. I went from Singapore to Fiji, to Sydney, to Maui. Like I was, it was like, that was one month of my life during 2019. And then January came and I said, I want to do something else. Something huge is coming my way. I can feel it. Again, that intuition. I'm very witchy. I trust my intuition. I spend a lot of time fostering my intuition. And I kept having conversations with people at my work that were like, you're amazing at your job, but this is not what you should be doing. There's something else out there for you. And everyone in my life was like, this is amazing. This is great. Why would you leave this? But the people I was working with were like, you need to do more of this. You are great at pulling stories out of people. You are great at fostering space for people to create their own stories. You should do this more. And your job is great, but it's not allowing you to do this more. So the people I was working with, the people I was talking, the people I was closest with were like, yeah, you got to go. And I was like, okay, I'm going to leave this job that looks hashtag blessed on Instagram (laughs) is literally paying for me to go to some of the most exclusive resorts in the world, hang out with people I never would have come in contact with otherwise. And I don't know when I could come in contact, like where you would come in contact with people like like the people I was coming in contact with. It's the most amazing people in the world. I left that to start my own business. And because the universe or whatever is out there has a really great sense of humor, my notice was like two weeks before lockdown. And I gave my notice and I was like, okay, cool. And I told them I would stay through the year and be a contractor for the events that I was in charge of that I was running. So they, cause I had revamped them a lot and I was trying to, I like wanted to make sure that these events were still ran well. And so I was pl- like, okay, I had this buffer. I was going to be a contractor for this company. And <laughs> yeah, no, the, the event world, there's no event. So no. I went from employed and traveling around the world to I live in the suburbs with my sister and her two kids now. Like I went from this jet setter lifestyle to married with a wife and kids in the suburbs (laughs) in the matter of two weeks. And it was something I thought would be temporary and it's not. We've all seen that it's not. And that has been glorious and horrible all at once. It has a lot been, of duality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I got to start Write Your Freaking Book already. And my Write Your Freaking Book Already program is a program that I have, it, I started because I one day wasn't writing my book. I was on Instagram and I was on the toilet looking at Instagram <laughs> and I got up to wash my hands and I looked at myself. I was like, what are you doing with your life? And I yelled at myself in the mirror, just write your friggin' book already. Put down Instagram and write your friggin' book already. And I mean, maybe it wasn't Instagram because this was a while ago. So it might've been Facebook but, or Twitter. I don't know what I was obsessed with at that time instead of writing. Um, so I did this program for myself. And then I was like, this worked for me. Let's do it again. And I did it again with my book. And then I did it again with a couple one-on-one coaching calls. But 2020... I was going to launch it as a one-on-one coaching. And then I realized that there were so many people who wanted to be a part of it. I made it a group program and I I was thinking about how lonely people would be. And I don't think, I mean, you're in the program. The camaraderie is so amazing that happens in this program that the pandemic, if the pandemic hadn't happened and I hadn't seen that so many people wanted to write a book that I couldn't take on just one-on-one. I probably would have never made it a group coaching. So it made this program and this business I was running, it made me stay home and build this amazing business and this amazing program and this podcast and everything that's come from it. And it made me stay home and hear my nieces scream and yell all day long every day (laughs) and eat mac and cheese for three nights in a row, even though I'm gluten and lactose intolerant. Like that's what the pandemic is, right? It's these dualities of two truths of it both being helpful and wonderful in so many ways in my life and also horrible and hellish in so many ways in my life too. At the same time. Yeah. (laughs) And then you're supposed to hold space for that while pretending that everything's okay. Yeah. And get sleep and exercise Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. do all of that. Don't go outside, but also you should exercise. Right. 
Don't eat too much, but the only thing left in the store is a box of mac and cheese. And you're lucky you got that. (laughs) I love mac and cheese so much. I know. You know what? Okay. People who are listening, can I give them away? Can I give away your location? Like the general, I'm not going to give your address, but like, so (laughs) Stephanie's in Seattle. And one of the things I'm super jealous of is my favorite mac and cheese ever is Beecher's mac and cheese from Seattle. And I found there's a new store nearby. I found it. And I was like, oh my God, Beecher's mac and cheese from Seattle. Oh my God. It's so great. I'm going to bring it home for my sister because I can't eat it. They had a gluten-free one. (gasps) I know. So I can take a pill for dairy and still get sick, but I found gluten-free Beecher's mac and cheese. And there's honestly, there's moments like that when you're at the grocery store and you find just the right thing that you want to eat right now that you think you actually like those are the moments where I'm like okay I can survive a pandemic like I just found gluten-free mac and cheese like I'm gonna be fine (laughs) it's gonna be okay that's all I really need in life if we really come down to it yes we have um features just the regular cheese in our refrigerator right now it's a a staple and I'm very excited that you found gluten-free yeah. Which is macaroni and cheese. And it is, it's these tiny things for me. It's in the neighborhood I live in. There's a ton of those tiny libraries, those free libraries. Oh, cool. And on my walks, it's happened twice where like a pretty obscure book that I'm looking for specifically, I have found it. And this has happened two times and it's made my entire day. Sometimes the whole week, <laughs> you know, I don't believe in the like almighty spiteful God that so many of us are taught that I was taught as a kid, but I, but moments when I find gluten-free mac and cheese, and when you find that book, you really want to write at a little library. That's what I'm like. Maybe there is a God and that God wants me to be happy. Like maybe there is a God that wants me to be happy right now. Yes. Just those, those bright spots that yeah. you're like, I can hang on till the next bright spot. Mm-hmm. You gotta know Absolutely. to look for them though and yeah. appreciate them. Yep. Okay. So I want to hear I would love to hear a little bit more about your writing journey. So little pieces have come up already. So, you know, starting with your birth, even though you didn't know at the time that you were a writer, and then it sounded like maybe around 16, oh, maybe this is the thing. And, but how did you, how did you get here? Like, we did hear a little bit about, it sounded like the leap was a lot of support from your last job. And then also being forced to then do it because of the pandemic. But what's like a little time travel of how you got here? Cause I know you've done a lot of cool stuff. I have. Um, so time travel, I think that we joke, we joked about my birth, but my birth probably actually had a lot to do with it. I think about, um, I was born on the same day as my grandpa, 60 something years apart. So he turned 93 when I turned 30. So 63, there you go. 63. We're doing math. math. We're doing math folks. You didn't know you were getting a math podcast today. (laughs) Um, I, and he was a painter and he was a painter, not because he was a painter. He was a painter because he was, he was retired farmer. He had done retired. He'd done farming his whole life and he retired and traveled the world and brought me back brought all his grandkids back with his wife a trinkets from all over the world and I remember painting with my grandpa holding a trinket he had brought from Egypt yeah it was Egypt and from Egypt and seeing a photo of him and my grandma riding a camel and just being like that's so cool being an artist and painting in a studio. And it was never about, like I was a kid, right? It was never about being good. It was just about spending the night at grandma and papa's house, waking up in the morning, putting on one of grandpa's white shirts and going and painting in the studio. And he just loved whatever we did. He was just so happy we were creating with him. Whatever we did was fine. And I think that I've only recently realized how absolutely huge it was to have someone in my life at an early age create space for for creativity just for the sake of creativity yes and I I like to think that I grew up in a town that wasn't very creative we were farmers we were you know there's a lot of problems that I could point out to in the the systems in my town and yet we had a we were a small farming town with an active community theater we were a small farming town with an amazing 
graphic design program that launched when I was in high school and an amazing art teacher. We had one of the most profound teachers I've had in my years and years I've been through schooling at some of the top tiered colleges in the world didn't compare to this random humanities teacher who would come to my hometown to teach. And so I think that it's easy, it was easy for me for so long to think that I didn't get raised in a town that fostered the arts because it would be really easy to look at my town and say it wasn't a town that fostered the arts. But there absolutely were those bright shining moments within that that fostered the arts, that gave me permission to think about the arts as a valid career option. That said, all I wanted to be when I grew up was rich and famous. Like that is all I wanted to be. That's actually not true. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be a marine biologist, until, I wanted to be one too. Right? I mean, it would sound so cool, right? Okay, so then my parents, so being funny. the lovely, supportive people they were, they I found a marine biology camp on Catalina Island and like begged them for years and they finally sent me to it. And I got there and it turns out, I don't know if you know this, but marine biology is science and it is not just swimming with dolphins. <laughs> I had the same tragedy befall me at some point while I was in middle school as well. Yeah, I was, I, I'm not going to lie. I was in fourth grade. I probably should have known better, but I was pretty devastated to get to this camp and have them expect me to do science. And there was no swimming with dolphins. There was no swimming with any wildlife. I didn't even get to pet a seal. And they were like, if you want to just swim with dolphins, go play at some fancy resort in Maui. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to need to be rich and famous to swim with dolphins. And so I'm going to be rich and famous. And <laughs> so I... I continued with saying what I want to be when I grow up is rich and famous until like now. <laughs> that, that was the thing. I changed it at some point through some hippy dippy therapy sessions to affluential and influential, but really Ooh. I just still want to be rich and famous. <laughs> and, but what that did for me was, was I recognized from an early age that rich and fame would allow me access and allow me freedom that I wanted to do things like swim with dolphins. And so I went off to school and I went off to film school at San Francisco State University, which was one of the top film schools in the nation at the time and was in a town full of gay people. So I liked that combination versus like USC or um, UCLA. I wanted to be in a town full of gay people because I knew pretty early on that I was gay. And like I came out at 12, knew pretty, pretty early on. And I went to film school and I studied, I did all the studying. I did really great in film theory classes. I did really great in film production classes, the production side of it, the logistical side of it, I was amazing at. The business end, I was amazing at. I lived in Italy for a year to study Italian film because I loved Italian film. So I lived in Italy for a year studying Italian film as part of my degree. I came back and I just kept, I don't want to be too degrading on myself because I was learning and I don't want you guys to think that it's not okay to be bad at first, but I was so bad, so bad in these movies I was making. I was so <laughs> bad, you guys. I didn't understand camera angles. I didn't understand any of the tech. I tried to edit things and they looked horrible. I was just like, no, this is not something I'm good at. And so I, I, but I was amazing in my screenwriting classes. And I, I got so good that they let me in the master's program and the PhD program classes on screenwriting because I just kept going up. And the head of the department was one of my screenwriting teachers. And he said, listen, Lauren, you got to pursue writing. You're an amazing writer. You have to pursue writing. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I suck at this whole filmmaking stuff. I was actually a really good director, but I couldn't figure out the tech of it. I was like, okay, cool. I don't get the tech. So I'm going to just go be a screenwriter. I'm going to go be a writer. And so I got a, and I also at this time, I really, I had just broken up with my girlfriend and I really wanted another one. So I thought that it would be a good idea to go work at a lesbian magazine, which was great because I got two girlfriends out of it. So I went, <laughs> I went and, uh, and, and countless... <laughs> You're such what? an overachiever. <laughs> right, right. Uh, countless <laughs> others. Um, a couple of them were other people's girlfriends at the time, but that's for a different story uh, for a different time. It's a different podcast. <laughs> podcast, my old podcast. Um, and I started writing about sex and sexuality. And I remember my dad sitting me down and telling me that he really didn't want me to get pinpointed and stereotyped as someone who only talked 
talked about being gay mm. and how it would ruin my career as a writer to talk about, to have been a gay writer. And I think that that was actually some of the worst advice I've ever gotten in my life because the more niche you are, the better you are. I got to work at one of the top magazines in the world because I was gay. I got, I then went to, I then lived abroad and was teaching English all around the world. And then I came back and I got a, a law degree. I decided to get a law degree because I wanted to work the other side of my brain. And throughout law school, I having, I like specialized, continued to specialize in being me, which was fat and gay and unapologetically me. And that continued to build my career as someone in law school. Um, so I was in law school and it, the recession hit and we were a little behind the recession. So my, the time when you're supposed to start getting internships, they were so hard to get, even these jobs where you work for free. No one was getting paid jobs. No one was getting anything. And I, um, I applied for a really prestigious internship that would have me working on the Prop 8 case. And a couple of my colleagues who were top in the class applied for that same internship and I got it. And I got it because I had spent my life being a gay rights advocate as a writer. And I happened to have also interviewed the director of this program at some point and they knew my work. They, the people that I was interviewing with had seen me be a gay author for so long that I got this prestigious space at the National Center for Lesbian Rights. I was there with people. I mean, I went to the University of Oregon School of Law. It's a top tier law school, but I was there with like Yale, Harvard, me, <laughs> you know? Like, and it was like top of the class at Yale, Harvard, Duke. And it was me who barely was passing <laughs> my programs. And I had somebody say, Lauren, I don't understand how you got this internship over me. I am third in our school and have all have straight A's and you, your GPA is so bad. You can't even put it on your resume. And I was like, I got it. Cause I'm gay. I got it because I'm unabashedly gay. I got it because I've been unabashedly gay for decades. And I haven't been afraid of writing about who I am and what I believe in. So I'm saying all of that one, because you asked about the progression and the storyline and how it all worked, but also because I think it's really, we live in a world that tells you, you can't pursue you can't be yourself and you can't pursue your goals unless you are a straight white man who has money. Um, and I want to say that it, the more I've been myself and the more I've pursued the things that I loved at my core, all of me loved, the more successful I've been in life personally and professionally. Yeah. I love what you said. I had to write it down that you were specializing in being you mm -hmm. and like, I could really get emotional about that because I feel like that's been a journey for me very recently, very recently. And because of what you just said, it's not, I wasn't told I couldn't do anything, but I also wasn't necessarily supported actively in pursuing things that it, it was obvious I was interested in. Like, oh, writing, that's not a quote, real job. There's yeah. nothing real about writing because it's all in our head, which is the coolest part about it. Like <laughs> when people are like, writing's not real. I'm like, oh, I know. Isn't that cool? I get to like invent stuff. It comes from nowhere. It's not real. Yeah. So I love that specializing and specializing and being me. And that kind of leads me into another question um, that actually Samantha, our lovely podcaster. Hi, oh, Samantha, our lovely podcast manager. Yay. She wanted to know what would you tell your younger self? And I'm interested to know what you would tell your younger self. And when I asked that question, what age do you think of? So I feel like I actually did pretty well until I hit sixth, fifth grade, which mm. is not a coincidence. No, it's not it's a coincidence not. at all. Nine years because old. Statistics show nine, 10 years old is when girls start, stop raising their hands and speaking up in class. Yes. It's when we are, we stop, we start worrying about our looks. Mm -hmm. It's when we are told other girls are our competition. It's when we are, suddenly we go from being the top in the class to the bottom. And, um, I had a fifth grade teacher that I think was kind of a dick. 
if I'm being honest and sorry, if this gets back to him or anyone in my hometown that listens and knows who that teacher was, but (laughs) he treated me and the girls in our class horribly and it changed me. And I had also moved across town and there was a no whole new people. So I changed to try to be like them, but that person and my sixth grade self, especially was a really, that's when depression came. It's when I came out and realized I was different than everybody else around me. Um, it's when I, you know, had my first kiss and it didn't go well afterwards. (laughs) It's when, so many things were happening and I had no one in my life telling me that's normal. That's okay. It's when I was forced on diets because I was fat. It's when the kids told me I was un, I mean this, sorry, explicit podcast, I guess it's my podcast. I can cuss. <laughs> I was like, can I cuss on your podcast? It's my podcast. People <laughs> like kids were telling me I was unfuckable in 12. And so much of what a woman's worth was, was that. And so if I could go back, it would be that person. It would be like, it would really be puberty, pubescent teenage Lauren. When people talk about fostering their inner child, I try to foster my inner teen because she was the one who just really wanted to make out with a girl and there were no girls around to make out with. Or she was the one who wanted to tell these stories and got laughed at when she did. She was also the one who was like helping start a community theater program in her hometown and like winning awards and running programs all over the world. Like by the time I was 16, I mean, I was a go-getter, don't get me wrong, but I was miserable. I was yeah. a self-harmer. I was, had suicidal ideations from a very, like from that age on um, until I was an adult and dealt with the fact that that time of my life was really hard. So if I went back, I think it would be less what I would tell her and I have, I, I live with my nieces and they're coming to those ages. And um, I have nieces and nephews that I am active in their life. And I, it's less that I want to tell her something and more I want to tell the people, the adults and the people around her to continually tell her, this is all a normal part of growing up. And that's what I just like really needed to know that I was normal and not, I was special and I was different and I was wonderful and I was unique, but I was also just totally normal. And I think that, that like it gets better doesn't was a great idea for like the I don't know if if, for people aren't familiar it gets better was a big campaign to to try to battle the huge suicide rate of teens in the United States that are LGBTQ but I for me it gets better wasn't helpful because I didn't have the time to get to the future I needed to know that you're okay as you are right now you don't have to wait till you grow up to be acceptable you don't have to wait for later for it to get better. It's okay right now. This is part of the process right now. This is normal right now. And so I would tell that to myself, but I would tell every single adult in my life to tell that to me as well. Yeah. And that's what I try to tell the kids in my life. Like, yeah, you're right. This sucks. Oh my God, this is horrible. You're totally right. COVID sucks. And it's totally a normal part of life to like be worried about how your body's changing right now. And to have these desires. And like one of my nieces came out recently. I was like, totally normal. She's like, what if I'm this? Totally normal. What if I'm this? Totally normal. What if I'm this? Do I have to choose now? Nope. Got to choose. Totally normal. Totally normal. This is all normal. You're, it's okay. You're special. And this is normal. Yeah. And it's so cool that, you know, both of your nieces have you and your sister, you know, their mom in there, super cool, gay aunt, you know, and just you know, yeah, we're both people doing what we're doing and I happen to like girls or, you know, it's just, yeah, normalizing it. And as if, you know, puberty isn't rough enough. Like I just, man, brutal. And I think like, again, it goes back to that thing. The more you are you, the more you give people in your life permission to be themselves. Like I have a friend who just yes. came out. She's 35. She's like, I didn't realize this is what I was my whole life. And now what the hell do I do? I'm an evangelical Christian family. Mm. Um, I had somebody re- email me the other day. I wrote a book called Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body. I did a lot of, I wrote for a really long time as Corey Bradshaw, a sex writer. I wrote for a long time about body image and loving my fat body and accepting my fat body and being okay in my fat body. And I had someone write me the other day that like, it's been 
they like I've been following you for years and there's been days where like knowing that you existed helped me stay existing so just by simply be and that's you know I'm very I'm a very public person but even by you being you Stephanie listeners even by you being you you are changing the world around you by simply just like being you as you are and I'm not talking about being you in a stubborn like my opinion's great I'm great wonderful everything it's just like being who you are unashamed of you not participating in shame is one of the more radical amazing things that we can do in our lives and one of my mantras is I will not participate in shame yeah and I mean what you're saying is so true and for me it doesn't matter if I have you know what similarities whether it's body type whether it's um who I'm attracted to it's when I see someone and you can tell when someone fully embodies themselves, I'm always inspired. And it's, um, I've been watching, this is a confession. I'm dancing with the stars, but I don't believe in guilty pleasures. So I'm just going to own it. And I've really enjoyed it. Um, and Johnny, where the figure skater was on there, he wore the most amazing outfits and just the whole non-binariness of it. I was going to say, just, does Johnny Weir go by he, him? I'm not sure their pronouns. We'll go with they to just to be safe because I yeah, know that they identify that. as genderqueer, I think. Yeah. Just to be respectful. Hey, people, this is a good example. If you don't know someone's gender pronouns, use they, uh, gender neutral, to, out of respect, just in case. Yes. But if you do know them, don't use, use whatever they choose. Yeah, I love that. Want. So they just, you can tell every dance and every outfit that they felt so good in it. And it helps a boring, well, I'm not boring. I think I'm pretty fun, but it helps, (laughs) um, uh, a cis privileged white chick. It helps me embrace who I am, you know, and even though I don't want to wear super loud colors, I get so pumped when I see someone else. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. I'm going to crush my dark green sweater today. (laughs) You're crushing it. It looks great. Thanks so much. But yeah, it's powerful. Okay. So I want to shift a little bit and head towards school for writers. So you've told me this before but I think it's important for everyone to hear kind of what School for Writers is about and the bridge that you're building with School for Writers. Hmm. I hadn't thought about it as a bridge I'm building. I love that. Um, We joke that we're building both an empire and um, we are building the business of Rose Apothecary from Schitt's Creek because we're both huge (laughs) Schitt's Creek fan. Again, somebody being themselves and creating a world where everybody gets to be themselves without shame, huge and radical. Another example. um, And I hope Daniel Levy listens to this one day and calls me and tells me that he also thinks I am radical and amazing and life-changing one of these days. Um, crossed, Right? So... I forgot the question because I was too busy thinking about Rose Apothecary and how much I love Schitt's Creek. Okay. Okay, What is School for Writers? And (laughs) what is School for Writers? School for Writers started as business school for writers, as some of you might know, like this, uh, this season, this is the, towards the end of season one. And we started as business school for writers because I am so sick and tired of being told that you cannot make money as a writer because I make six figures a year as a writer and I have consistently. And so I have traveled around the world on other people's dimes. I have met some of the most powerful people in the world as a writer. I went to law school, that did not get me there. Being a writer got me there. I wrote a sex blog during law school and had a teacher pull me into their office and say it was going to ruin my career and it made my career. So I think about I graduated, when I graduated, I had a judge's wife at a wedding I went to of a fellow law school friend pull me aside and tell me that I was selfish being a writer. And I remember being like, first off, I don't know you, bitch. Like, go away. Projection. Like, nah. (laughs) But um, yeah, my little, I can get, my little like honky tonk roots can come out sometimes. People, (laughs) when people hit at me. Um, And, but I... 
I feel like she told me that it was selfish because in her mind, as a writer, I would never be able to make enough money to pay off my student loans. And in her mind, as a writer, at choosing to get a law degree and then become a writer, I had taken a spot at a top tier law school from someone who would have gone off and done the law. But in my mind, I tried law school and I'm a horrible, horrible legal writer. Like I failed my legal writing courses, <laughs> but I had these articles in Vice Magazine that were going viral because I was talking about the law. So I could talk about the law because I had just learned it, but I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to be a lawyer. And so I was making an amazing impact by following my skill set and making a pretty good living. Like I because I had a law degree, I negotiated three times as much as Vice was paying anyone else at the time for their columns. I was able to do that with my law degree. It was an, I don't regret it a day in my life, even though I still have six figures of debt from it. But this like, concept that everybody had when I graduated was you just threw away your law degree. And I'm like, I never wanted to be a lawyer. This was always just a way to be a better writer. And I didn't know that the whole way through. There were times right. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to be a lawyer. No, this was always just a way to be a better writer. And so when I I ran my own writing business for a while. I, was, I wrote about sex for a while. Then my brother died. And honestly, you guys, I love talking about sex. But when your brother dies, you don't really want to have to be reviewing sex toys and porn and talking about it. Like it just didn't, I couldn't do it anymore. And so I started writing about body image because that's really what I was writing about when I was writing about sex is I was writing about what it's like to be a fat queer person existing in the world. I did my law school thesis paper on pornography and queer porn and fat queer porn. And so I was writing about fat queer porn. So it was an easy transition to writing about loving your body. And I was also struggling with loving my body. So I wrote my book, Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body because I needed it. Like, right. That's the best thing you could possibly put out in the world is the book you need. Yeah. And so you need to read. And so I, I start, so I did that. And then I realized that there was still this concept in my mind and everyone else's mind that writing couldn't be a profession, that you couldn't make money off of it. And when I got this job to work for this speaker, this amazing celebrity that I worked with for a while and really loved my job, it was too good to be, to turn down. So I, sh I shut down my business and I had probably daily, maybe not daily, but pretty close to daily friends that were writers call me for business advice because they knew the, they knew how to write beautiful, beautiful, heartbreakingly beautiful pieces of writing. They'd gotten their MFAs. They had learned the craft and they couldn't, they couldn't do it because they couldn't pay their bills. They couldn't, they didn't get to be writers. They couldn't share. They couldn't write because they didn't know how to make money. I had a friend who was in an MFA program and they weren't allowed to talk about how to make money as writers. It was forbidden for them to talk about how to make money because it would ruin the craft. That is the world we live, like we have set up for writers. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I, I just kept getting this idea that I needed to teach writers the logistical side of writing. So I started business school for writers because I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to teach the business techniques to writers. And then I realized that that was hilarious because it's not just business. It's the logistics. Like write your friggin' book already is a very logistical program. It's like, here's your step by step program on how to write your friggin' book already. But it's also not like you don't have to, you could still like you could be in wife, but not follow a single step and still write your book. It's community. It's support. It's permission. And when I realized that the thing that I'm doing is not teaching business skills, the thing I'm doing is teaching logistics. And then I'm really doing is giving you all permission to be writers and kind of like guidelines for how that would look differently. If we were in a world where writers didn't have to be starving and tortured and put their head in an oven or starve to death on the streets, like our, our, you know, like Edgar Allan Poe and um, Sylvia Plath or these people that we idolize or drink themselves to death, like Hemingway, was it Hemingway that, yeah. No, it was the Fitzgeralds that drank themselves to death. There's so many tragic stories, it's hard to keep them apart. And I wanted to start creating works from joy 
and works from logic and creativity combined together. I want you to tell the story your heart needs to tell. And then I want you to sell it for friggin' millions of dollars. Like I want both for you as a writer. And so, so we dropped the business school and we just let it school for writers. I want to teach you what you need to do to get your story out in the world and to make money off of it. Yeah. And I think, I think of a bridge because it's, it's in between, I don't know what I'm doing. I think I want to write, but I don't know where to start. And, and you've told me about this gap and then there's MFA Mm -hmm. getting a degree in in fine arts and that there's all the stuff in the middle. Like you don't need that to write. It's Um, actually really sad. The statistics of people who live, who leave MFA programs and never write a book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also come from the romance world. Um, where people look down on romance. They knock it. They call it a guilty pleasure. They call it trashy. But romance saved the publishing industry. The average reader reads two books a year. The average romance reader reads 100 plus books a year. And the way in which we just talk about art as it is this thing that only elite people get to be or do actually puts so much pressure that people can't create art. Like I didn't create yeah. art for a really long time. Ira Glass says a lot of people are stifled by their, their, they won't create art because they know what good art looks like and they don't want to create anything but good art. But like you guys, I mean, Stephanie, you want to tell them about the first draft of Life Boat, what we do in the I, first draft? <laughs> I was just thinking about that. And it's, it makes me think too, is it, was it Brene Brown? Was it Liz Gilbert? Was Which it Glennon Doyle? Then? One of them who talks about, writing the shitty first draft. And so our first draft, first of all, when you're telling us, okay, first draft, we're writing 40,000 words. I'm like, you're hilarious. There's no way I'm doing that. (laughs) And you constantly reminded us, you're writing crap. This is not supposed to be good. And it makes me think of being, you know, being an adult, we don't want to start something new because we don't want to be bad at it. Mm -hmm. But you're not allowed to be bad at things at an after a certain age. Like at so what bogus. point did I not allowed, was I not allowed to sit in my grandpa? Like at what point was your art no longer okay to make art because it wasn't good? Yeah. And who's to say if it was or not, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I and- think about like my niece, my youngest niece, she's eight right now. And the other day I asked her, if she would draw a painting for me. Um, I'm not going to say what for because it's Christmas presents and people might listen. But I was like, I need you to make a label for me for something. And she's like, oh, I'm not an artist anymore. I'm bad at it. And I was like, when did you get bad at art? You're an amazing artist. She said, I'm not like my older sister. Um, And I said, does it matter? You're still an artist. And she said, no, I'm not an artist. I'm not good at it. And I'm like, at what point did she get to someone telling her she wasn't good at it so she couldn't do it? Like, how do you, how are you supposed to get good at something if you can't do it unless you're already good at it? Yeah. And I just wanted to remind everybody, I feel like it was, it's really important to know that every single message I send out during the first draft includes the poop emoji. (laughs) Yeah. We had worksheets with the poop emoji and it was, it did take off all of the pressure. And I think especially for writing in these creative things that maybe we've grown up being told aren't important enough or you can't make money or whatever it is that prevented. I didn't say out loud that I wanted to write a book until a couple years ago. And I knew that I wanted to write a book since high school. Like, Mm. and getting that permission repeatedly is what I needed. And then it was such a relief to have that first draft out of my brain. Mm -hmm. Like there was space for, you know, learning all the lyrics to Hamilton finally. It's important, (laughs) important work you're doing. And now there's space for dancing with the stars. That there is, there is. Also important work you're doing. Yeah. And now, you know, getting towards the end of the third draft, I have 58,000 words that I typed. I'm like, whoa, that's And you printed it out and held it in your hands too. You got to see it where it used to just be in your head and you were like, it has to be good to come out. And also in the third draft, we have a big prize for the person who finds the absolute worst sentence in there. (laughs) I want to celebrate bad writing. I want to celebrate bad art because we can't get to, actually, I'm not even going to say it's to get to good. You can't get anywhere if you just hold it in. Like it doesn't matter if it's good. What matters is you're creating it. It only matters if it's good 
when you're ready to put it out and share it with people. And even then it doesn't really matter how many bad, bad books have I read and still kind of like, you got my money as a writer. I still read it and gave it a review on Goodreads. I still spent hours of my time reading it. I was like, ah, that wasn't that good. I'm just not going to finish it maybe, but like, that's the worst that can happen is somebody doesn't finish your book. I know people who do that, like, oh, you guys, okay, don't judge me, but I really love bad Hallmark movies around the holidays. Like, and I just said bad, right? I just, even after, even in this, I still judge it, (laughs) but I judge it because my sister will like, she's like, will walk out of the room. She's like, this is so bad. I cannot be in the room for it. And my niece and I are sitting there eating popcorn and like peppermint bark and just like, yes, this is our holiday season. And I'm, I think I might have to buy the Hallmark channel this year just to have an endless supply supply of cheesy holiday romance films. This is coming from like a lesbian who I'm not like actually wanting to get the guy, but I just love them. (laughs) I love them. And I think I love them more because everybody tells me I shouldn't love them. Yeah. That's my husband's mom, my mother-in-law, she loves the Hallmark movies. Like (laughs) she records every single one and I haven't watched them. Not because I, I don't have a strong opinion either way, but to me, it's like, if it makes you happy and there's no harm happening, go for it. Yeah. 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 And I think that, that it, there are ones I don't like, but I also, oh, you guys, I can't watch horror films. I don't read Stephen King. Ever, like Stephen King's an amazing author. I haven't read his most important works because good luck getting me to sleep afterwards. So what is good for me? My sister, she can read The Stand before going to bed and she loves it. I have to read a cheesy romance novel because it gives me this happy, warm, fuzzy feeling that I go to bed for. Like, it's just finding what's good for you. So what's good for one person Like, don't knock your art because it might be exactly what someone's looking for. It's very true. Okay, I have one more question, and then I have a rapid fire. (gasps) Rapid fire? I love rapid fires. We should include more rapid fires. in. Yeah, so this was Brene Brown. Brene Brown does it at the end of her Unlocking Us podcast. So some of the questions I borrowed from that and other ones I made up. I and learned so much in my life from Brene Brown. So thank you, Brene. Oh my gosh. Love yeah. Brene. So what is, what are you excited about for 2021? Whether it's your writing career personally, whether it's school for writers, what are you excited about? Y'all, my team and I, that includes Stephanie, got together and did 2020 planning. And it is going to be, to quote the kids these days, lit. And I, I honestly, we have, we don't have so much planned, which is so exciting for me. We have decided to niche down and what we're going to do, what we offer is going to be so, we're going to give so much attention and love to the next round of people. So write your friggin' book already. Super early bird special is actually open now. If people are interested in starting to sign up and starting to apply for it, because we do try to make sure people are the right fit. And we do try to make sure that we have a diverse group of people t- writing about a diverse subjects. Um, so you do have to apply for it, but uh, you can, if you're interested in that, you can go to write your friggin' book already.com. Uh, So super early bird, we're starting getting people in it and trying to get it. And the goal is to have a really solid, amazing group of people in that program to give all of our like love and attention to and help get more stories out into the world. And I'm just the Wifeba 2020 group. That's what we call it. Wifeba, right? Your freaking book already. The Wifeba 2020 group is beyond amazing. These people were so amazing. And that was having launched it without like any, like it was within two weeks, I had all these people. It was just amazing. And my intuition just drew me to them and people sent them my way. So I'm really excited to try to get, um, four times as many people in this next one because we have help, because we have stuff. I'm like, I, you guys, I hope you can hear it in my voice and see it. If you're watching, I am, I start shaking when I think about this because I'm so excited because here's the thing. I am a selfish human being. I don't do anything if it doesn't center, if it doesn't like benefit me in some way, even if it seems like I'm being altruistic, it's never that. So I want to read your books. And I don't say that as like some sales gimmick. Someone's like, oh, you're just saying that sales gimmick he wants to me. I was like, oh no, I read 70 books a year. And I really want those to be books. Like I choose people for the program 
who I'm excited about like getting to know them and seeing what book they decide to read. And that's not a pressure for the people joining. I mean, I don't know, Stephanie, did you feel like that was a pressure that I was like, I can't wait to read your book. Did that feel like a pressure to you? That's a good question. I no, ask. it didn't. I'm thinking about it. No, it didn't feel like pressure. And I think because when we had talked about what I wanted to write about, you were excited and reflecting back to me that I got excited Mm -hmm. when I talked about it. And so then, like we've talked about before, it was, you know, me being selfish. It was about me. It wasn't about you. (laughs) See, I I honestly think that everything should be about us because if we put ourselves first, then we get our needs met. Like not in that selfish, narcissistic, megalomaniacal way at other people's expense, but we shouldn't, we do so much, especially as women at our own expense. I think that like it, wife, but is helping you write your book because I care, I am invested in your books. Like if I didn't care, if you were just somebody who was giving me money every month, because you were enrolled in this program, that would be a different interaction. One I don't want to be a part of, like I care about reading books that I helped bring out in the world. Like that, I love books, I love stories. I think they change the world. I think they heal communities. I think they heal ourselves. And I think that they're the way in which, speaking of bridges, we bridge gaps in this world. Uh, statistics show that you're more likely to vote for gay rights and believe in gay rights if you've sat down and had a conversation with a gay person about their lived experience. If you read my book about about my lived experience, you're more likely to have empathy for me. I know I understand more about the world and the cultures and the lived experiences of people because I've read their books. And so I believe that reading makes better humans. And so if you can write your book and I can read it, then I get to be a better human and that's all selfish. So selfishly, I want to have lots of people in Wifeba 2021. And we have this ama- these amazing coaches that are going to be helping people along the way. We have group calls. You have the option of one-on-one coaching. There is like, we have built-in incentives. I mean, I'm just, when you ask about something that makes me excited about 2021, I am shaking with excitement over what Write Your Freaking Book Already 2021 is going to be like. 2020 is already amazing and it's still going. And these people are just beyond every day. They inspire me to be a better person. And I cannot wait to have four times as many people that are inspiring me to be a better writer and better person. So that's wife, <laughs> and I feel like I just went off. You know, when you know when you're in like in love and you can't stop talking about your girlfriend. That's how and you I keep feel. looking at your phone every five seconds. Yeah, to yeah, that's how I feel about right your freaking book already. This program that I created, and I think that that's why um, that's why it was so successful the first time I did it as a group, and this that's why I know that 2021 is gonna fill really quickly because I hope that everybody who's also excited about books are like, yeah, this is my year to write my freaking book already. Um, I'm excited that we have this new masterclass coming up that's going to help people choose their book because the number one thing I found keeping people from writing their book is they had 20,000 ideas and they couldn't pick one. So I'm excited about being able to offer that for free to people. That's at uh, businessschoolforwriters.com slash choose your book. Um, you can also sign up for that at writeyourfrigginbookalready.com because so many people who come to me they don't need a full program. They just need to like no- choose their book and then they're good and they can sell it. Some people want a full program. They need the structure. Some people don't. Some people are trying to get their book out in a month, not in a year. And Wife Buzz for people who are really want to write a high quality book in a year and have lots of edits and lots of support. Some people are just like, I got, I'm going to self-publish a book for my business tomorrow. I'm like, awesome. Let's support that too. Um, so we have Path to Publish that helps support that as well. And then we have, I can't say names, but we have some pretty cool high impact clients that are people who have these like life-changing stories that we're, that we're working with as well on the side. And then the podcast. I'm so stoked about the podcast. Um, I have a list of dream people I want on it and I want to get at least four. I'm going to say four. I was going to say one. I always take like what the number that's comfortable and try to four times it to like make myself move out of my comfort zone. At least my dream goals are outside of my comfort zone. So I'm going to say four of people on my dream list on the podcast. So that's exciting. Um, And I have two books that I'm working on, um, a sequel to the novel that I am out out with agents right now. And then um, I'm currently thinking about writing a, a, I'm currently pitching a memoir um, about eating during quarantine. 
And so Stephanie's really excited about that one. And actually oh, yeah. that started because I kept just talking about it and writing these little like short stories about the various different food things, food related <laughs> things that were happening around my house during quarantine. And um, every time I mentioned it, people were like, I'd buy that book. I'd buy that book. So I'm going to, I'm pitching that book currently. Um, and then I, this is normally the time in my life where I, in these, like, what are you excited about the next year for my 30th year where I would list the dozens of places I was planning on going and traveling to and the dozens of things I wanted to do. But, um, in this year, I, I am a COVID cliche and I bought an RV and I hope to just spend some time in it riding in the mountains. That's my like big goal for movement wise in 2021. Yes. All of that is amazing. And I'm very excited to be a part of it. You probably didn't expect me to go off about my love for this new girlfriend wife that I have, but <laughs> I mean, we're in our second year. It's really serious. You guys, technically it's we've serious. been flirting with each other for the past decade, you know, just like one-offs here and there, but now I'm really fully committed. <laughs> it's serious. She's really pretty. I like her. Could be heading towards marriage. I know. I think we're, I think if we're you going, want that, I think we're going the long run. Okay. Now I'm going to go into rapid fire. So okay. I'm just going <sighs> to hold on. No, like you overthinking. Get just... ready. No overthinking. Do you know me? I do. That's why I wanted to do this. <laughs> so you had to warn me. Okay. This I am a, a lesbian. Challenge. We process a lot. <laughs> okay. First question. Cheese fries or tater tots? Oh my God. Why would you do that to me? How can you start with that? Okay. Here's the thing, you guys. You no, guys. there's no thing. <laughs> it's a thing. I don't care if this is rapid fire. You can't ask me to choose between- You could just cheat and say both. No, I can't. I have to explain. <laughs> I know that our business says tater tots over everything. And that is one of our values and our mission, and our mission statement. However, I'm going to go against my values and say fries with cheese. And here's why. Because I grew up in the kind of town where like, you know how Philadelphia has cheesesteaks and like New York has bagels? My hometown has fries with cheese. And I feel like I would potentially never be able to come home again if I ever chose anything over fries with cheese, even though tater tots are also a love of my life. Fries with cheese. Final answer. Go. Next one. That was quick. That was quick for me. <laughs> it was quickish. It was quickish. Um, <laughs> what is something people get wrong about you? I'm actually really boring. That is such a lie. <laughs> I'm so boring. I am so boring. Like the thing I want more, actually, I almost said this too. It's so interesting. The the thing I want more in life, like the, the thing I want most right now in life that I don't yet have, but it's coming my way is a house in the woods that I can be at alone to write and sit and drink tea and read books. I'm Definitely pretty boring. I mean, I'm, I'm also the kind of person who's going to like, when I can leave again, leave that to go like find some rock star random. Like I'm really good at finding random celebrities at places. Like I'm going to go have some crazy wild adventure too, but really I'm just, I'm so boring. Also, that was another rapid fire. So you can't ask a storyteller rapid fire questions. This is true. I, I've got a lot to learn. <laughs> okay, this one. Uh, let's try this one. What TV show are you currently watching? Oh, my God, you guys. I never thought I would be into it, but The Queen's Gambit. I, I can't stop right now. I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know I it was about, about chess. It. I didn't know anything. It's like, it's good. It's not anything at all that I would ever have watched if you had told me what it was about. It's high on my list. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, because you got to have something to laugh about too. I'm watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine right now as well. Rewatching, and it's bringing me lots of joy. I don't watch a lot of TV because reading and writing has become a priority in my life. So I have to shut my TV off. But when I watch it, it needs to be escapism. Yeah. And so Brooklyn Nine-Nine is like the epitome of escapism. It's true. Okay. What's on your nightstand? Oh my God, you guys, it's embarrassing. I have like 20 books. Okay. Let me think through it. Tell me no, why. No, not all of them. Just. <laughs> no, you yeah. asked, you asked a writer reader what's on her nightstand. First off, my to read is behind me. It's, it's like stacks and stacks of books go all the way up my to read list. But um, on Love my it. nightstand is um, Tell Your Why by Peter Goober. 
The Girl Who Could Move Shit with Her Mind by I Don't Know, I'm Sorry. I'm rereading actually right now Unbound by Steph Jagger because I had a dream that I was dating somebody who was trying to teach me how to ski. And I have this feeling like my next girlfriend's going to be a ski instructor. Not sure where that comes from. It was a good dream. So I, if, if she's anything yeah. like in the dream. Keep us uh, updated. <laughs> right? I'll let you know. Um <laughs> I don't ski. So that should be interesting. Um, I'm reading Jubilee by Jennifer Gavon, a friend of mine from my hometown as well, who's been on the podcast. She was, I think episode six, but somewhere around there. Um, I also have dialogue by Robert McKee, the book on the craft of dialogue, which is an Ooh. amazing book and has been really helpful. And wife is going to get a rundown of what I've learned from that and other dialogue books I've read and courses I've read. Um, Raina Telgemeier's Ghosts. It's a graphic novel about a girl with cystic fibrosis. And my sister's best friend had cystic, well, she had cystic fibrosis and she passed about the same time my brother passed. So my sister has been trying to get me to read this book for a while and it's been too tender. But yeah. um, I, I started reading it again in Dia de los Muertos. And I think that's it. I have a I have a pretty big stack. Oh no, Edge of Glory by Rachel Spangler, a rom a romantic romance book about two lesbians. One's a skier, one's a snowboarder, and they're kind of outed at the Olympics. And yeah. so it's really good. It I was like good. when I first started reading it, I was like, I don't know. Like I don't know, but I had that dream that I was going to date a ski instructor. So I was like, okay, I should read about skis. And I didn't even remember that I had it on my bookshelf. I had bought this a while ago, not even interested in skiing and snowboarding. So I'm just saying, if you're a snowboarder or a skier, give me a call. Because <laughs> there might be something here. Just saying. <laughs> uh, so that's my, yeah, that's my side table. I just finished Edge of Glory last night, Rachel Spingler's lesbian it's really good if you learn to lesbian romance it's probably one of the better lesbian romances i've ever read actually good to know so okay. the stack is like a foot it, or two high it can never be too high in my opinion right sometimes you have to break it into two stacks but yeah okay few more which Shit's creek character or characters do you most relate to you know i think that i want in my soul to think I'm a Moira, but I'm really a David. Mm. I don't know. What would you think I am? This is rapid fire for you. <laughs> Cables have been turned. Yeah, I think maybe a slightly mellower version of David with pieces of Moira. Mm -hmm. Like the the self-command that Moira has, definitely that. And instead of wigs, I have an earring collection. Yes, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. But I think yeah. I have a little Johnny because I have a lot of the entrepreneur spirit in me too. That's true, but that could also yeah. be a little bit, a little bit Alexis. Did a not little bit that. Alexis. Did yes. not plan that. If, if you, you haven't know, watched it, Creek, know. go watch it now. <laughs> if you know, you know. And if you don't, highly recommend Shit's Creek. Okay. These are the last two. They seriously are rapid fire. This has failed spectacularly, <laughs> but we're going to end strong. Um, these are fill in the blank questions. Wait, can I ask one question? Do you think that when she listens to this, this will keep Brene Brown from bringing me on her podcast because she knows I can't rapid fire? Brene, I will rapid fire for you. This is just your practice run. This is my practice. Okay. I got it all out, Brene. I promise I'll <laughs> rapid fire just for you. Okay. Um, fill in the blank. 2020 is life-changing. 2021 will be life-changing. <laughs> I gotta use the same. Um, that still counts. That I'm going to go. Okay. Here's what I'm going to go. Um, I am a witchy and I follow an astrologer named Chani Nicholas. Chani Nicholas. It's like Annie. Yeah. Chani Nicholas. Sorry, Chani, if I said your name wrong, but she's amazing. And um, she's one of those people who gives astro astrological advice wrapped up in progressive political social change. And she said that 2020 was the year for me to plant magical beans and watch them grow. And she said 2021 is a year for me to harvest those beans and weed out the things that no longer serve me. 
And I feel like that's what I'm doing. And also by when I say she told me, I took a course from her online. We do not talk regularly. And, <laughs> she but texted we, you this? We can change that. Yeah, I'm a big fan of your work. If you want to work together, just give me a call. But I highly suggest her book, You Were Born for This, even if you're not into astrology. I think she has this beautiful way of making you feel like you are normal, yes. like you are okay as you are. And like the world can create space for people to be who they need to be in safe ways. And it is radical to accept yourself as you are. And her book is about radical self-acceptance through astrology. And it's beautiful. I love it. It's one of the okay. few books I actually don't suggest on audiobook. I almost always suggest the audiobook because I love audiobooks, but I would suggest the written version of that one. Yeah. Okay. That is what I have. So thank you for letting me come on here and interview you because I've always wanted to be on a podcast. <laughs> is and this your first second, podcast? It is. There was That's one so time exciting. that I like called in and was on one. I mean, I'm counting but, that too. This is like your half, one and a half. That's right. So, and you know, we haven't known each other for that long. So it was also really fun to be like, well, what do I want to know about Lauren? <laughs> I am um, just to tell the little context. So I told my team like that December 1st is my birthday. I want to do a really special one, but I don't know what to do. And um, they helped come up with this idea. And in the past I had been my actual, oh my God, this is the five year anniversary of the last time I was on my own podcast. So I had a body love podcast for a really long time, interviewing people about loving their body. And the day my book came out was my 33rd birthday, Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body came out on my 33rd birthday. And we had a podcast celebrating the books um, coming out. And that was the last time. And it was five years ago. So it feels good. It's been five years since I've been on my own podcast. So I'm going to do it every year instead of every five years because I'm too narcissistic to wait five more years. But- (laughs) Um, it was nice to like celebrate that again, to be on here again. So thank you all for coming up with that idea and helping me to execute it. Absolutely. We're here to help. I have an amazing, amazing team. Shout out to both Stephanie and Samantha. And I, for people who are out there who are entrepreneurs at all, because I know I have a little bit of followers that are both, right? They're just people who want to write a book and they are not necessarily looking to build a business. And I have people who are, who want to write a book to build a business. And for either of you, I want you to know that or people who are just like trying to make it through the world. I know we're separate, but it's it's so important to have a team, like to have help. I have been that person who fights it every step of the way, but how much fun I had today and how much fun I have with you all planning 2021 and having people, having people is just so important. So thank you for being my people and people get your people. Yes, for people. Yes, for people. Um, any last parting words? I know that that's probably your line. I'm so used to offer like saying that, but any last parting words? You know, I think for me, I've had such a radical change in my life in the past couple of years. And I never, I did the nine to five project manager, admin assistant, all this stuff. You know, I live my life doing things that I was good at but not that I necessarily loved. Mm. And so to have this shift in the last, you know, through write your friggin' book already, and then being part of your team, the fact that today I woke up and, oh, today I ha- quote, have to interview Lauren for this podcast. I mean, I don't know that I've ever had an extended period of time at a job where I was like, Ooh, I get to do this today. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I'm surrounded with books and writing and it's, I never thought that it would be a thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I just, the whole idea of so many books, so little time is taking on a whole new <laughs> meaning. <laughs> Tell me about it. I actually, I should have shared this earlier. One of the reasons I started Write Your Friggin' Book already is because my goal is to have a bookshelf full of books that I brought out in the world. And I can't write that many books myself. So I want to fill bookshelves with books that I help that otherwise wouldn't be out in the world. And I want it to be, I mean, we didn't talk about it. I, I am, it is so much a part of what we do that I don't talk about it enough is we, we focus on marginalized voices. Like 
that's who we try to bring into everything we do is, okay, is this a story that's not already out in the world? If you are the mart, the main voice that we're already seeing a lot of, and you're already taking up a ton of space out in the world, like that's not who we're going to really work on. We have scholarships for people who wouldn't otherwise afford it. Like we're aiming towards women and queers and people of color and people with different, dis- with different abilities. And we're aiming for those voices that their stories have been told by other people in the past. And we want to yeah. help them tell their story themselves. We're aiming for people who have memoirs about abuse that are reclaiming their voice. We're looking for people who want to start businesses based on what they love because they've been silenced in their jobs for so long. Like this is, this is the work we're doing in the world. This is how we change the world through amplifying marginalized voices and helping people who've been historically silenced tell their stories. So it makes me so happy that you feel so happy to be a part of that. And that's why you're on my team. And that's why you're in WIFA because you have a story to tell and it had been silenced for too long and now it's not. And it's a really beautiful story. And I'm excited when we can have you as a guest on the podcast talking about that story being out in the world. Oh my gosh, that will be unreal. And like in the background, I could see my book on your yes. bookshelf be like, yes. oh my gosh. Yes. Amazing. Love okay. Love fest over. Let's go back to being hateful now that we're offline. Oh wait, we're not <laughs> offline. Never mind. We actually like Shoot. each other. <laughs> well, thank you again for doing this. And um, I guess it's you, you, you sign us off because it's your podcast today. Oh yes. I've taken over. Um, I was so happy to be on the podcast today and have a chance to celebrate you on your birthday and get to know you a little bit better. So I look forward to everything that you're working on, everything that we're working on together and very excited for next year and very much looking forward to next year's podcast season as well. So, so excited about some of the guests we have planned. Yeah. yeah. So happy well, birthday to you. Thank you. I'm going to go celebrate by making myself cupcakes and I hope you all do the same. Yeah. I mean, I can yeah. do that. Yeah. I would actually love it. Oh my God. Birthday wish. If you all could go and make cupcakes or like some kind of dessert, whatever you love. I don't actually like cupcakes. I'll probably make pumpkin bars instead, but some kind of dessert that you love and send me a photo for my birthday on Instagram. That would make me really happy. You can do it at school for writers. Yeah. Follow us, tag us, tag us. And if you don't want to make anything and you just want to buy something, cause that's, that is valid. Yeah. I'll take a picture of my box of red vines. Yes. Red vine, birthday red vines. I just found out they're not gluten-free and that's why they were making me sick. I just thought it's because I ate the whole thing of it. Um, they could be both. And so that made me really sad that I can't actually eat them anymore. So eat, eat some, eat some red vines for me, folks. It has to be the gluten because I, more than I cared to admit, have eaten an entire box of red <laughs> vines during the pandemic. And I felt completely fine. <laughs> I know we're supposed to be ending the podcast, but I have to say that my niece once ate a whole box of red vines and then puked red for three days. <laughs> so Ooh. don't be that person. <laughs> On that note, yes, everybody, thank you again for celebrating my birthday. And if you eat some delicious decadent thing, please send me a photo as a happy birthday present. Awesome. And I'm just going to say my usual sign off. Like I, I mean it when I say I cannot wait to read your books. And so if you all are interested in getting your books out in the world, just keep following us. We're going to help you out to do that because that's what we care the most about here in this world. And that's what our goal and mission is in life. Bye everybody. Have a great day. Hi podcast listeners. This is Stephanie with this week's book recommendation. If you haven't seen any of my content on the School for Writers Instagram, I highly recommend checking it out. I also work with Lauren as a coach for her program, Write Your Freaking Book Already. I'm currently writing my freaking book already. This week's book recommendation is The Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. And if that name sounds familiar, you may have seen any of her shows on TV including Scandal or Grey's Anatomy or Private Practice. She's also an executive producer for How to Get Away with Murder. So basically, she's amazing. So in the year of yes, it's part biography, autobiography, part, I don't want to say self-help. I feel like that gets a bad rap. More like self-motivation-y. So in the year of yes, she talks about an entire year where... She didn't let 
her fear get in the way to the point where she would say no. So she would say no to a lot of things because she was used to being in the background, doing the writing, being behind the cameras. And then people caught on to how great she was and how cool she is and wanted her to do college graduation speeches and go to fancy award shows. And she was in the habit of saying no. So in the year of yes, she says yes. And it's so, I love learning about people that I admire and hearing about their lives. I like hearing when they open up and share why they've made particular life choices for themselves, especially when they make life choices that go against the grain of what society would like everyone to do. I found this book really empowering and one of these books where I feel like Shonda and I are friends, even though the odds that we would ever meet are slim to none. But I found it very accessible as far as the book that does offer different opportunities for the reader to say yes, get past fear, push ourselves a little bit harder. And when that's done well with storytelling, it can be very powerful. So I highly recommend The Year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes. I recommend buying it because there's going to be a lot of underlining happening. And don't forget to support your local bookstores. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. And if you like this recommendation, if you read it, let us know in the comments. Let us know on the Instagrams. And we will see you next time. Thank you.